Welcome to the Marshall Pruitt Podcast and our Inside the Sports Car Paddock weekly feature brought to you by the Justice Brothers Automotive Care Company and also our awesome partners at Cooper Tires. This week we're actually going to do something a little bit different. We're actually going to do a split two-day, two-item, two Inside the Sports Car Paddock release. Today it will be the standard, hopefully what you are starting to come to expect, that being an opening tech talk with our friend Jeff Brown, race engineer for the Core Auto Sport IMSA DPI team. Then we'll follow that with an interview with Ryan Eversley, our good pal Ryan Eversley. He not only of Dinner with Racers podcast fame, but also he of excellent race car driving fame, champion in World Challenge last season, and also now with a new affiliation with the Gradient Racing PWC team in their Acura NSX GT3 Anytime I have an excuse to catch up with Ryan, talk about his world, both podcasting and race car driving, well, that's a pretty easy formula. So we're going to start off with Jeff, as we normally do, helping to bring you inside this uh, technical world, this engineering world that he and I live in. Uh, for Jeff, it's something he's never left. For me, it's something that I left, uh, I don't know, 15, however many years ago to do this, start doing this media thing, but... I just love catching up with Mr. Brown and helping to discuss things that interest us, hopefully interest you. This week we start off with traction control, something that is not only pretty cool uh, discussion-wise, learning about its origins, but also its use today and how it has become far more than just a binary vehicular tool, but also a very big driving aid and something that drivers now use to tune just like they would tire pressures wing angles or otherwise so we go pretty long on that with jeff and then we move into the final topic with him on something that seems rather simple but that being radios and also another area where very surprising how much tech is truly involved in the simple art of communications then we move on to ryan and bid farewell to this episode tomorrow we will be back with a second Inside the Sports Car Paddock for the week, and this is actually an Asian Le Mans series special captured by our pal, our Week in Sports Cars co host Graham Goodwin from Malaysia last weekend during the Asian Le Mans series season finale. All kinds of good folks that he sat down with there, so we're going to break that out into a special Inside the Sports Car Paddock Asian Le Mans series feature with our man, Mr. Goodwin. All right, with all that said, Let's get going with Jeff Brown and Ryan Eversley, brought to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers. It's become a weekly tradition on Inside the Sports Car Paddock. Mr. Brown, how are you? Understand you are now warm and in Florida, coming off of a couple of days of IMSA testing at Sebring. Yes, it was, um, it was uh, quite a good test. It was nice and warm and sunny. We got a little bit of rain, but... Uh, you know, when it rains for an hour or so now, after what we had at Daytona, we're like, ah, oh, that was just drizzle and it's not nothing serious. So yeah. uh, it was good. We got a little rain testing. We got a little night testing in on the first day. We got to run till 9 p.m., so I did a little running in the dark. And, um, yeah, it was a really good really good test uh, jumping over the bumps at Sebring. I think folks enjoyed your uh, insider info and general insight on bumps in particular at Sebring and how that affects damping strategies. Uh, this week came up with two topics of fun. We're going to start off with traction control and what it is, how it's used, and how it's actually a very powerful tuning tool, not just from a, I guess, engineering standpoint, but also as a driver's, uh, I guess, honing the chassis, honing the car's reactiveness standpoint, might be surprised how big of a role traction control can play in shaping that. And then we're going to close on something that might sound rather benign, and that being radios, but it's something that actually has become, like everything else, an incredibly high-tech part of our world. So the, the first time, Jeff, I remember hearing about traction control, I think it would have been... 89 or so in Formula One with the uh, Ferrari chassis that year, the 649 driven by Nigel Mansell and uh, Gerhard Berger, I believe. And hearing about this really interesting electronic intervention 
of slowing down wheel spin uh, at the rear based on wheel speeds, one calculating the rotations of the front tire, the non-driven tire, comparing it to the rear tire, the driven tires, and essentially saying, hey, wait a minute, if the rears are spinning faster than the fronts, well, that's a tractionless moment. Let's try and use our electronics to dial that back so we're not just wasting time spinning tires. When was the first time you heard about traction control? Oh, yeah. I Probably I heard about it then and thought that was pretty cool, but all the cars I was running were not capable at that level like most things it's you know formula one gets it first and it kind of trickles down and i suppose the first time i really used it super effectively was back in the old grand am dp days would have been like 2006 probably Mm. where i could really use it and we could really tune it and it was something that actually i mean that year i will say people won and lost races based on how good their traction control was. Wow. I mean, it was, it was that, uh, for sure, that year, traction control was a, was a deciding factor in, in race wins. And not only in just lap times, but tire life and, you know, um, stint averages and things like that. So that's probably the first time I heard about it before then, and I dabbled in it a little bit, you know, on this guy had traction control, but where we could actually tune it and program it and, write maps and really control it precisely was probably 2006 and and you know what we're using today is certainly more sophisticated but it's still based on the exact same principle you just described um you know the idea is you you know the speed of the vehicle based on the front wheel speeds and the rear wheel speeds if they're going faster you're slipping the tires and some amount of slip can be okay too much can be bad and also too much in the wrong time at the wrong place can be bad so we've uh, it, it's it's more sophisticated but um i guess i could start out by describing kind of how it works in today's dpi lmp2 world and then um go from there right yeah i mean the the first iteration that i knew of was one where it was simply an electronic an electronic intervention through spark. So if you had your 8, 10, 12 cylinder Formula One motor, we would have the traction control uh, system effectively cutting spark to a number of cylinders to get the wheel spin under control. And the worse the wheel spin, the harder the cut. So in very practical terms, while it might have been a Ferrari V12 that was spinning its rear tires, as that uh, wheel spin ramped up, and depending on its severity, for a brief amount of time, uh, good old Nige or good old Gerhard would have had a V, who knows, 7, V8, V9, and once you got the the tire spinning under control, you'd get all uh, spark back and all cylinders firing appropriately. It sounded, you know, uh, you could obviously tell, you could close your eyes and tell who was on traction control and who wasn't. And yep. then I know the more modern uh, way of doing things, and, you know, there, there's still both, but uh, you can get into timing, for example, and uh, manipulating yep. timing of the vehicle. So maybe explain, Jeff, some of the more modern ways that traction control is achieved. Yeah. Yeah, so the way it works now is we're still trying to do the same thing as control the wheel spin, and there are various um, various ways we can cut. As you said, um, you can cut. You can actually cut cylinders, just shut cylinders off when the wheel spin is too much. And, and, and let me back up for a second. So, all the traction control strategies for. Um, the one mode, which is like a longitudinal power down straight mode of traction control. We'll talk about the second mode that we use, but let's talk about just you're off the corner, you're lined up pretty straight or dragster almost stuff. straight. Yeah, dragster stuff. You mash the gas and the rear wheel start to spin. We have what we call a slip target, which is 
the amount of slip in percent of front to rear. So 0% is the rear wheels going the same speed as the front wheels. Uh, 1% is the rear wheel turning 1% faster than the front wheels. And, and so we have slip targets. And you'll often hear drivers um, talking to their engineers race about going up on traction control or going down on traction control. That's a knob that the drivers have in the car where they can turn up the slip target. So that's like an inline dragster, as you said, dragster kind of um, of traction control. And, and we're able to adjust the amount of slip will allow when we're in inline acceleration. And it's called a, a slip target where the drivers will have the ability to change the amount of slip that they allow. You'll hear drivers say, I'm going up on traction control, or the engineer will recommend doing that. And that's that's actually allowing less slip in percent between the front wheels and the rear wheels. And that's simply controlled by the amount the traction control. Like you said, you can cut cylinders, you can cut, now we can cut, boost if it's a turbocharged engine we can actually retard the timing to take some power away you can also um, change the acceleration how quickly the engine is is reaching that target you know it'll actually look at it and go well we're only three percent slip now but the way the engine's accelerating the way the rear wheels are accelerating it's going to be to five percent too quickly so it'll start to back it off in a closed feedback loop to hit the target that you want. And that's actually one of the more fun ones to get feedback from drivers on because they're telling you, I am, I cannot, I'm putting my foot through the dang bulkhead. I can't give it any more throttle and it's not going. And it's like, yeah, right. that that's actually by design. It's trying to that's keep you from sitting there doing a, a nice big smoky burnout on corner exit and having the worst elapsed time ever getting into the braking zone you know where you're headed so uh exactly. but that, that but that does i think it's also worth noting jeff that is a little bit of a uh it's a bit of a mental agreement that uh, drivers have to accept in those situations where again uh probably the more adept uh, manufacturers at engine tuning and ECU control that you know do just as you mentioned they don't necessarily take away just boost or cut cylinders but actually effectively dial down the overall performance of the engine in that moment and you have a driver saying give me more give me more you have to realize that it this is actually the fastest way even though it feels like the throttle pedal is maybe a bit numb or not giving you what you expect for that uh, brief second or two. Exactly. And it's, it's one of the things that will work with the drivers is, is they'll say, oh, the traction control is holding me back too much. I like it in the center of the corner. Right when I'm just getting on the throttle, it's great because I can lean on it and it make the car stable. But then it stays on too much too late. You know, so like I want it to release me and free up on the corner exit and let me go because I don't need it for cornering anymore, and it's holding me back too much. And the traction control engineers will play with their their maps and stuff and try to free it up a little bit. Um, the other interesting thing that we can do in today's technology is each corner might want a different traction control strategy. And like a real slow corner, Sebring Turn 7, for instance, you might want a different traction control settings and strategy than you would in, say, turn 16 that leads onto the back straightaway or turn 17 that leads onto the front straightaway, the faster corner. So we can actually use GPS-based traction control where it, the car knows, the computer knows where we are based off the GPS and knows, okay, turn 7, switches to this traction control but when it gets to turn 16 it switches to a different traction control um so we have gps based traction control you can also do gear based traction control you have one setting every time you're in first and second gear and a different for third and fourth and so you can you can get yourself 
very confused and very quickly <laughs> well, I, with all, I, I, all of the options. And I love the fact that I was hoping you were going to mention the GPS base because that might not be something that most uh, racing fans, sports car fans, places where traction control is allowed might not be something that is, is very well known. And so then you get to the inevitable, well, what if it's super crazy cloud cover and there's a fire nearby and there's smoke in the air and it's, you know, name all kinds of conditions that might prevent a uh, perfect connection with a satellite overhead. Um, but, you know, there's always some form of secondary, uh, I guess you could say fallback system where uh, it could just simply be distance based as well, where the car will know that, um, you know, the lap is uh, X long and you know however many feet long yep. and we are at you know x amount of feet here therefore this equates roughly to turn you know turn five and this is what we're looking for so uh, a couple yep. of ways to make sure that you know at least in the gps based um traction control scenario that uh, weather and or unforeseen issues uh, won't necessarily turn your car into just a uh, an old school non-tc vehicle Right. We actually use GPS and distance together, and they compare constantly to each other. And if they're both like, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, this is where we are, and the distance goes, yeah, this is where we are, and they're all happy with each, both happy with each other, everything's cool. If one of them disagrees, then it can default to the other one, or if it gets completely mixed up for some reason, it defaults to a base traction control that's kind of good for every corner maybe not perfect for everyone but good for every corner so you never get you know you never have a driver go into a corner expecting to be able to lean on the traction control and suddenly it's gone and he just spins because it's uh because it's not there so and then there's another aspect to traction control other than just the straight dragster type of straight line acceleration um most sports car systems nowadays employ a system that will actually look at the yaw rate of the car. In other words, we have a gyro in the car, and it measures the rate that the car is spinning, could be a good way of looking at it, uh, rotating around the, the center of the car. So when it's the back sliding out quickly, that's a high yaw rate when it's sliding out slower that's a lower yaw rate so it can actually employ start activate the tc based on a yaw rate so if the car snaps if the back snaps real quick it can put the tc in real hard to try to prevent that from continuing to rotate and spin if it's not coming around as quickly it will allow more power to be fed in so the car can come off the corner quickly so it's almost like a uh, oversteer reducing type of traction control with another knob that the driver can adjust the amount that he wants so you have two modes the straight ahead and then the yaw rate traction control that we can adjust and that lateral that lateral yaw which is, again, I think what many folks would associate first with I'm turning, I'm turning, getting around this corner, I'm getting back on the throttle, and I'm getting a little bit of wheel spin at the rear. How do I manage that? Now, again, these two in line and call it lateral, the yaw, track control, mapping, those things will intersect, but it's interesting to think about how they can be tuned, and maybe this is the uh, the last big note to explore. So, traction control's original uh, manifestation was we're losing time spinning our tires throughout the uh, throughout a lap. We have more power than we can effectively put to the ground. How can we reduce that? Eliminate it? Something. And the more we can do that, the more we we can eliminate it through this new traction control thing the faster our lap times will be. Great. And almost right away, uh, especially as electronic capabilities increased, this went from a bit of a, call it, vehicular tool. Hey, the car will be faster just like if we put on a different wing that's more efficient or a, a new set of dampers that help the car corner more, you know, ably or otherwise. 
this very quickly went from being call it a vehicle innovation to a driver tool and as you, sure. as you mentioned there are some drivers who really do like to have a little bit of traction control intervention as they are you know say from the apex of a corner out to help manage that process and obviously make it a, a faster process but again there are some who depending on how they drive they like the back of the car to be a little bit more lively to move and so if you were to ratchet up traction control you could keep that thing locked down so it never budged an inch sideways at least again uh, just from an excess of power being put down and so that is where it'd be interesting to hear you jeff uh, with all the, the various cars and drivers you've worked with maybe share some stories of how some have said wait until I'm just at the end of the corner before it intervenes because I actually want some wheel spin to help set the car. Um, and you might have others that say, no, 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 get rid of it altogether. That's not what I like. Uh, it, it, that's, uh, it's very much a driver, a driver thing and also an engineer thing. It allows us to do things with the car, both driving and engineering, that you couldn't normally do. Let's say... For instance, you had a car that you wanted to turn into the corner sharper, better. But when you adjusted the chassis aerodynamics or suspension to do that, it got so loose or so snappy at the exit of the corner that you had a lift or you had a uh, back off the throttle so much that you were hurting your exit speed. What you could do now is still adjust the chassis for that great turn in, but let the traction control take care of that problem at the exit of the corner. Where normally you couldn't have the nice great turn in because you were too snappy at the exit of the corner. So you have to give up that. So the traction control becomes something that we can actually use to help change the balance of the car and the feel for the driver. And drivers, a lot of drivers will say, you know, they might come in and say, hey, I need it to do this. And I'll say, ooh, that's going to make it looser on the exit. And they'll go, doesn't matter. I'll just turn the traction control up and let it take care of it. Mm. So some drivers really, really understand the use of the traction control for allowing us to do some setup things that might not have been possible in the past. Pretty amazing. And maybe let's add on one more thing, just because you have the experience uh, working with a number of auto manufacturers that uh, some are more uh, hardcore on traction control and uh, its perfection than others. Everyone works at a super high level, so it's not a case of there are some that are great and there are some that aren't. Everybody's fantastic at it. Obviously, without naming names of those manufacturers, can you describe a uh, you know, situation or two where you can think of where you know that working with, with this brand A over here, boy, those guys are just going to be up all night trying to perfect this, you know, perfect traction control for this track, for what we're asking for, because they know that they can find exploit little zillions of a second here or there to uh, to beat their competition. I'm sure that there are some that stand out that way. Sure. I can tell you how important traction control is to teams in general. So our little team at CORE, we're an independent team with very little um, manufacturer support compared to the big factory teams. And we employ a traction control guy. That's what he does. He comes to the racetrack and he tunes our traction control with us. He's employed by us to do that. Can you imagine what an Acura or a Mazda or a Cadillac are doing? I mean, I can tell you what they're doing. There are multiple traction control people that do that full time for them, tuning the traction control, looking at all of the various parameters that they have available to them, trying to design new, better, more sophisticated systems that are better on the engine, better for fuel economy when the traction control comes in. Um, 
all the DPI manufacturers have taken traction control very, very seriously. And it's because, like we said when we started this whole thing, it's purely performance. I mean, it's it's tire life, it's lap time, it's setup ability, it's um, it's consistency, it's it's something unfortunately the fans can't see. They can see a new big wing or a new cool de- development that the car has, or hear a different exhaust note or something. But traction controls, you know, lines of code, but. It's super, super important and, and very determining of the outcome of these races nowadays. Let's move to something that, again, probably sounds like the most boring. Are you guys really <laughs> going to talk to us about radios? But it's become something that was that once upon a time, Jeff, right? Yeah, radios. You yep. talk into them, people yes. talk back. Er, to, right. holy cow, uh, this is a true technical system that deserves uh, a, a Jeff Brown explanation. And I, I know I told you a bit of a funny story from uh, earlier in the decade at Indy that I'll sprinkle in somewhere just to understand how uh, articulated radio systems have become. But, I mean, Jeff, right. wh- what, do you, what do you have to work with on the timing stand, as you mentioned with your Core Autosport team? What kind of uh, just, com- I don't even want to say radios anymore, communications network uh and then we can also talk about what's in the car too all right so yeah it 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 has evolved quite a bit as you said um obviously we have the simple uh race engineer pushes a button talks to the car driver hears it driver pushes a button talks back um in the pit stand we have two other basic systems and one of them is what's a what's called a crew channel, which is just another frequency that I can push a different button, and that transmission goes only to the crew members on the on the team, so the driver doesn't hear it, so I can prepare them for a pit stop, you know. Hey, we're going to come in in three laps, we're going to change tires, set four, we need a full load of fuel, the driver needs a drink bottle, and we're going to keep the same driver, so I can tell them that kind of a thing. So that's on the crew channel, um, just a different frequency. And then we have an intercom, which is a hardwired intercom system that allows us to talk duplex, just like you and I are talking on the, on the phone right now. You can interrupt me at any time. I can hear you. We can both talk at the same time and both hear each other at the same time. But it links, think of it like, I guess like the old party lines. It, it links anybody who's on this intercom system. So I'm on the intercom. My uh, assistant engineer, Tyler Neff's on the intercom. We have our traction control guy that I just talked to, Henry, on the intercom. We have our systems engineer, Lee, on the intercom. And we have our crew chief on the intercom. And then there's a couple blank headsets that the driver who's not in the car can listen to he can be on the intercom listening as well and so we have a constant dialogue during the race when we're doing strategy you know hey look at what happened here look at this okay we can go three laps more on fuel do you do we want to change tires do we want to do this it's a constant chatter basically and we all know each other's voice and people know when to stop talking when something critical is happening or you know me and tyler my assistant engineer need to work something out critical the engine guys will stop talking or whatever so it's a constant open loop system where we can all talk during practice when the car stops in the pit lane we plug a cable into the car and it links the driver into that intercom loop so we can talk i can talk to him openly all the other people on the intercom loop can talk to the driver and hear what the driver's saying and we can discuss anything about the car anything technically and since it's a hardwired closed loop system that's not broadcast none of our competitors can hear us because we all monitor everybody's radio i'm listening to all our competitors during the race or somebody is on our team and our competitors are all listening to us during the race. 
So during practice, we don't want to say, hey, we're gonna, let's go up two PSI in the rear tire. <laughs> and the driver says, hey, I need a little bit more traction. That really helped. I really like that. You know, We don't want our competitors knowing what we're finding out and what we're doing. So it's all on that closed loop intercom system, which makes it kind of boring, as you found out. <laughs> well, yeah. So... <clears throat> I guess I don't. I don't want to say earliest. It was four or five years into this new reporting thing I was doing, but a, a decent amount of time since I'd stood on a timing stand of my own, uh, or you know, was a part of the engineering team on a timing stand or otherwise. And so I think it was for the 2010, maybe the 2011 Indy 500. I'd pitched the Ganassi team on the idea of spending a day with the team uh, with I think Frank Dario Franchitti's car, and just trying to bring fans inside what a day of running at the Indianapolis 500 is like. So not just turning the wrenches and whatnot, but plugged in, listening to the communications, uh, obviously agreed in advance that I would, to your point, wouldn't be giving away, hey, they came in at this time and the, it was this ambient temperature and so on, and they went up three pounds here and changed the camber from this, you know. Obviously, being a, a race engineer, I know what's going on, I know what they're doing, but had to agree to not uh, share that and what I was going to end up writing, and so all agreed, everything was great, get down, you know, whatever, early, half hour before the running started, and handed me a headset, great, here you go, I think I have my little iPad with me to take notes, and it was pretty darn hot that day, and so watch Dario comes down, hey, how you doing, brother, climbs in the car, they fired up, and... Uh, I think I heard whomever it was say, all right, you know, I'm going to roll out, going to do um, whatever install lap, and uh, we'll see you right back here kind of thing. And uh, got some sort of uh, just a little click on the radio. Often that's what drivers will do or are instructed to do. You don't have to say yes, got it, affirmative. Just a, uh, a, a quick click on the radio button is just received as an acknowledgement. <clears throat> and... I think I might have heard 100 words total spoken across <laughs> an eight-hour day, Jeff. And uh, it didn't take too long for me to realize that, oh, they gave me the, uh, call it the uh, the boyfriend's, girlfriend's, whatever headset right. that, uh, as you mentioned, all of the true, truly interesting conversation was taking place through the umbilical cord, through them plugging in through that open loop system of everyone plugged into the timing stand and then obviously when Dario would come to a stop they'd plug in and so it was just quite fun to have my headset on and when he came back in from that install lap and I can see him flip up his visor and you can see his kind of face moving like he's talking I look over to the timing stand they're chatting away radio, radio silence in my ear and I'm like Come on, man! I got better things to do here than stand around all day and getting like genuinely. The only things I would hear was uh, turn four, which was just Dario's way of saying he was you know entering pit lane. And I'm like, ah, so yes. Um, next time, remind me to be smart enough to say, hey, I got this great idea for a feature, and it involves being plugged in to the timing stand and the full communication system, not the uh, idiot headset. Go stand behind, uh, the, go stand behind the, uh, the timing stand and just kind of look cool. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a, it's a great system because, you know, everybody's looking for an advantage and we, you know, during the races, obviously there's a little more information coming across and the teams have to tell their drivers and the drivers have to tell the teams a a little bit more and, and and teams monitor that the, the big teams will have one person assigned to doing nothing but monitoring the competition's radio and then reporting that you know that's usually a person that's fairly technically savvy and they'll re, they'll kind of filter out what's important and what's not and then they're on the intercom and they'll relay that to the engineers or the assistant engineer so that um you have the information of what the other teams are doing. And it, so that becomes important, but the intercom is where all the real action and all the real cool stuff happens now. And uh, even on the crew channel, you know, people will monitor everybody's crew channel. So when I need to talk to the crew, it will, you know, you'll hear something during practice, you hear something like, okay, guys, 
that rear change we talked about, we're going to do that next. Well, that doesn't help any of our competition, but we've already talked before the session that rear change might be, you know, 100 pounds softer rear spring, or it might be a rear wing change or something like that. And they know what it is, and they just head off and do it. So um, the systems have become pretty sophisticated. There's digital radios that in that basically send the the transmission it's not really encrypted but it's digital and it's hard to hard to receive and and decode Hmm. and IMSA does not allow the use of that for car to pit communication it has to be on a UHF frequency between a certain band you have to register your frequency with IMSA because not only do the competitors listen to the other competitors, IMSA listens to all the competitors. Oh, yes. So, so, and they want, it, it, they want the fans to be able to listen in as well. And they actually, the big racing radio companies will print lists of frequencies for all your teams. And then you can bring a scanner to the track and you can pick out the frequencies of the cars you're interested in and listen to the drivers and the engineers talk during the race. And it's part of the enjoyment of the fans, and it's a great thing that that they do that. Um, A lot of European series allow digital radios, and the fans have no access to that, which is kind of a shame. Let's close on this, Jeff. So we've spoken about the team side, the, the, the cold side of pit wall, if you want to call it that. Let's talk about the car. So you've had this pretty cool thing for a while now, which is still, I think, a little bit magic in that in endurance racing, multi-driver racing, how the heck do you know when one driver uh, gets in, the other one gets out, how do you stay on top of that from a timing and scoring standpoint, Uh, how does the series know who is in and out since so many of these cars uh, have, you know, a lot of... Um, either protective material or windshades type stuff and, you know, can't necessarily see what helmet or whose helmet is in the car based on banners and this and that and the other. How the heck do we do this? And the secret, oddly enough, is for your radio plug. And uh, why don't you share a little bit about um, not only what you use in the car to communicate, but also how the driver's helmet and the connection plug there, plugging into the radio system when they get into the car, is actually also a pretty cool informational tool as well. Exactly. Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty cool system. They, in the driver's plug, there's a small, it's basically a resistor, and when you each driver has a different one, and you have to um, register which. Um, resistor basically you have which goes corresponds with which driver and then IMSA will check that when you go through safety inspection they'll check each driver's helmet plug it into a little box to make sure that that you know that uh John Bennett is on number one and Colin Brown's on number two and like the ball's on three and so on and so they know who's in there and when we plug in to the when the driver plugs into the car it transmits to IMSA that that driver's in the car. And that's how we talked uh, two or three episodes before about drive times. That's how IMSA knows which driver's in the car when the car crosses the pit exit line and starts the timing for that specific driver. And it goes further than that. As long as we're talking about communication, um, people have seen on the IMSA races the, the leader light or position lights that show which position each car is in that is transmitted back and forth between IMSA and the car the car is constantly talking to IMSA's communication for the driver ID plugs and for the car position and for the lap times to the timing transponder and we're also sending back telemetry data on boost and RPM and all the technical things that we have to comply with. That's all being transmitted back to IMSA through the communication system. So the radio systems have gone from just a simple voice to transmitting lots of data and important information, not only from the car to IMSA, but IMSA transmitting back to the car to change the leader lights to show the fans what position each car is in. 
I love it. Next, we need to talk about how uh, your son Colin, and I know you've also been involved, but with uh, George Kurtz and the CrowdStrike um, security company, basically, uh, talk about uh, making sure those transmissions are secure and otherwise. I'm guessing there's a there's probably some pretty interesting stuff here to learn as well about how cloud-based uh, security. Who knows? It'll be interesting yeah. to see how such things maybe creep their way into more and more motor racing to make not just sure that radio transmissions are secure, data transmissions are secure. Uh, you speaking about telemetry, receiving live telemetry as the car is circulating, you also will receive burst telemetry as well when the car crosses the finish line uh again depending on the series and whatnot you can receive a huge dump of uh information there as well so yeah, yeah i think that's another area not for today but another one to discuss at some point in the future about how uh when you when your car crosses the line you don't have uh your rivals going oh thank you for that nice meaty information package all, all that right. data we're going to look through right now um so anyways jeff as always you are a gem thank you and uh, i truly enjoy our conversations each week even if these are things that you and i know or have done on our own uh, throughout our careers i love the fact that we are going to make time every week who knows i mean there might be a week where uh, you're busy or, or otherwise but uh we're definitely motivated here to try and just bring the technical engineering stuff whatever bring you inside that a little bit more of these uh, tech talks a lot of fun here and also as you've done with Jeff uh, and don't be afraid to send them my way as well if there are topics you're curious about ones that we haven't spoken on things that you might want us to go in a little bit deeper that maybe we have broached before whatever it is send us send us ideas I mean we do the stuff for a living so we talk about whatever um, right. essentially we're just trying to trying to share more of it with you so you can know more see more and hopefully enjoy your sports car racing even more than you already do absolutely i really appreciate everybody sending in hit me up on social media for ideas and um we'll try to these were two that were that came along that way so let's keep doing that it's uh it's fun to talk about uh what people want to people want to hear so my little address is at marshall pruitt m-a-r-s-h-a-l-l-p-r-u-e-t-t and what is yours on Twitter, Mr. Brown? Um, it's at J-V-B-R-A-U-N, and that's Instagram and uh, Twitter, both of those. You old Instagram star, you. All right. <laughs> you are a motor racing engineering influencer. That's your new uh, That's your new tag there, Jeff. Well, go and enjoy, oh, the, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your weekend, my friend, and we'll look forward to speaking here soon. Sounds great, Marshall. Thanks. Always a pleasure. Ryan Eversley always a fun time when we have you on the little Marshall Pruitt podcast but this is your first appearance on our brand new inside the sports car paddock interview show so I don't know if that's a a good thing a bad thing if you're doing backflips or currently shaking your head like I seriously need to improve my decision making capabilities in life there's too there's too many podcasts out there you know what I mean (laughs) it is it is just got to get rid of more of them so read a piece of news this week uh, that had your name attached to it, and I had my usual reaction, which is a flashback to my one of my favorite movies of childhood, Scarface. I think we actually spoke about this um, when I was on Dinner with Racers, about how my uh, the parenting that was applied to me might have been a little bit suspect, since my mom <laughs> took me to see and let me go see Scarface three times in the theater when it had just come out. Right. Right. And so having learned about your new... Uh, relationship with gradient racing for the entirety of the uh, of the World Challenge GT America's effort in their Acura NSX GT3 Evo, I had that flashback to my favorite scene in Scarface of where they're in the little boardroom setting with uh, Mel, the dirty cop, and his uh, his henchman guy, and uh, they shoot Mel in the stomach and he dies, and the henchman's sweating bullets, thinking he's about to get killed, and. Uh, the guy says, hey, man, you got a job. So <laughs> that's what came to mind. I'm ha- always happy when I hear Ryan Eversley is getting more and more job opportunities. So tell us about how this gradient racing opportunity came together. This team formed out of the uh, the ashes of C.J. Wilson Racing's uh, brief 
IMSA effort last year. How did this come together, and do you like the fact that it seems that if there is a Honda or Acura uh, to be used in professional competition, man, it seems like you're getting the call. Yeah, it's, it was kind of a surprise uh, last-minute opportunity, but not uh, not unusual. Like, basically, the, the backstory is Andrus and I have been talking since last year. Andrus Lavin, the team owner of Gradient Racing, and, uh, you know, in fact, he came to Daytona last year knowing that he was going to have his car pretty soon and wanted to look at the heart car up close so he had an idea of, like, tools that he would need and, and some other things. And so we had already kind of kicked around the idea of working together at some point when he got his car and uh that kind of stems from a relationship of competing against each other in the in the continental tire series you know because he ran the cj wilson cars and uh obviously i raced with compass and heart and so you know just kind of always had a mutual respect for one another i believe and that kind of led to when he decided to get an accurate that we we would chat on it on a regular basis so um Mark Miller is their, you know, their lead driver. He's been Till's coach the last couple of years, and Mark has a conflict with uh, Trans Am next weekend. So they needed somebody. I was, I'm available, and I've got experience with the car. So it's one of those, like, perfect storms. But uh, I hadn't heard from Andrew since around Daytona 24-hour weekend of this year. So when I got the call, I was kind of like, oh, wonder, wonder what's, what's up, you know? And so his exact words were, are you busy next weekend? No. <laughs> so I said, no, I think I could probably make it. So we – uh put that together and uh, I hopped on a flight literally the next morning and uh, flew to Coda and we had a two-day test which was really cool because I hadn't driven the Evo kit yet and uh, the big the big idea behind that kit is working on aero improvement and usability and obviously Coda's got a lot of high-speed stuff uh, built into that track for the F1 cars so we were able to really see the difference which is nice. So this opportunity that you have maybe if you could run just speak to the fact that whether it is Hart uh, and that awesome, awesome team uh, that we love so much, or a gradient or similar, it seems like, I don't know if you agree, but it seems like you've reached a pretty good place in your career where you are coming to mind first for a lot of people uh, for some really cool pro racing opportunities. If that's accurate, What's the feeling like then compared to however many years ago when you were the guy trying to gain traction and hope that one day your name would be among the top two or three on many people's lists? Yeah, I I was doing the math, and this is my 10th season of racing Honda products and HPD developed products stemming back to the 2010 series with the Compass Racing and the Honda Civics. And I think that's part of it is being loyal to a brand or a manufacturer and, or a program for that matter, even if it's not a factory based or backed one. If you're, you know, you look at guys like Bill Riley, he uses the same drivers for years after years because he has a relationship and a trust with them. And so, um, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I don't think I've driven for a team for like a single year in, in, for, for the last 10 years. You know, I've always stayed in places for long periods of time, which I think speaks to, some sort of reputation that I'm good to work with or at least consistent or successful. Some some sort of combination of that, hopefully. Um, but it's been really neat to see Honda appreciate like the effort I put forward and, and Acura and HPD with social media, with on-track you know, results, with fan interactions and things like that. And so I think it's just a culmination of all those things coming together and obviously having the championship last year with real time helps, you know, keep me in mind for TCR rides and Honda civics. But yeah, you know, I, I think this is probably the most, or I should say the least stressful off season I've ever had. Um, I talked with HPD last, geez, probably September. And they said, Hey, we're, we've already got a ride lined up for you for next year for, uh, for TCR. And we're going to try to tell people how much we love it when you drive our Acuras. And, uh, and that's helped quite a bit. So knowing I had opportunities, for this season back in September of last season then we didn't finish that championship until October so yeah. it, it wasn't one of those things where I was like well because you won a championship we uh, we'll go ahead and give you this it was more like hey we like what you're doing keep doing it and we convinced this team that they should hire you again so it's been crazy it's been crazy but it's also been really really cool what do you think Ryan as you start to look a few years down the road I don't know maybe even as early as next year is there a next step or stage of your your career that you are 
wanting to develop that maybe you have not had a chance, <coughs> excuse me, had a chance to so far? I mean, one of the things that comes to mind is uh, international stuff, right? You, we see some friends of ours who are <coughs> seemingly on a plane going to name the strange 12 or 24 hour endurance race somewhere throughout the world uh, maybe even more than we see them racing at home domestically I know that you know you, you do some of that as well but just curious if there are any things you look at your career and go all right what are the things I really want to add on in the coming years yeah there's a there's a few things that are kind of in the back of my mind at all times one of which would be to go do the European GT3 scene with you know with the GT, with the NSX, and uh, I have a chance coming up to go overseas for a for not for, for, for an event that's not really a race, but it could lead to some more opportunity with the with the GT3 NSX. Um, but uh, there's obviously I want I want to race cars anywhere and everywhere. The TCR thing last year, I really enjoyed the the Civic Type R, and I, my my hope was that somebody in Europe would say, "Hey, that kid did pretty well in the." the u.s version let's bring him over to do the wtcr series but nothing really came out of that yet um but i uh obviously i'll, I'll race anywhere anytime and i used to just want to drive anything but now i can see the the benefits of being a factory associated driver and being a loyal brand associated driver and i think if somebody showed up tomorrow with like a pretty cool car that could probably win a race if it wasn't gonna be a longer term deal i probably wouldn't consider it as much but the overall thing and if art art states here listens to this he's probably going to cringe because he's tired of hearing me ask but i want to drive that penske dpi and i don't care i don't care what anybody says um i've, I've been able to help convince a lot of streetcar purchases for acura and i think that should at least give me some sort of note you know to get to drive that thing so um I don't think I should be replacing Juan Montoya or Dane Campbell. Well, Those but I, I was going to say, I mean, I was given, not like I'm one to speak, although I am very slowly slimming down, but man, uh, as I told Montoya more than once at Daytona, it's like, geez, Connie's, your wife's cooking is clearly very good. I mean, uh, brother, I, I don't know what we're going to, they might have to make this an open top or uh, some sort of retractable roof to get you in, brother. You're kind of swelling up a little bit. So JPM just might not be able to fit, I think. I see a window for you to uh, take over that seat. When they first announced Montoya was going, I was like, hey, I'm a little chubby sometimes. Like, he and I can get together. We'll be the fat car, and we'll probably still do really well. Um, but, no, like, I, I look at that program, and I'm like, man, that's awesome. A lot of my friends from HPD that worked on the TLX program because it's the same motor and the, and the NSX program, they're, they're working on that. So I'm always checking in with them, and um, they all know how badly I wish I could just drive one lap for Roger Penske, even if it was in a private test. Um but I, uh, I understand how things work. I'm not an idiot. However, uh, I'm not going to stop asking to drive yeah. that car. And, uh, and, the, and I think Art and, and, and Steve Erickson at HPD, they understand where I'm coming from. And they know that, uh, you know, I, I just want to drive anything and everything I can. I'll drive the Baja truck. I'll drive a monster truck that's got an Acura or a Honda engine in it. I don't care. Um, but uh, if I got to just race GT cars for the next five or six years – you know, at the competitive level of SRO or, or IMSA or whatever, that would be still winning the lottery 10 times over. So, um, you know, I, I, I love driving that TCR car so much because it's so fun. I would just say my biggest disappointment last year is that we didn't have more outright pro cars show up for World Challenge. Um, but now in the IMSA series with the Type R, with the factory Hyundai team moving over there as well, and we have a lot of great privateers that are running with the Audis and other cars, Alpha, um, it's shaped up to be a pretty strong touring car series, but yeah, I'll drive anything, man. You know me. I also, I, we thought we might have <clears throat> Mazda on the TCR grid for 2019. I'm hearing that that's going to be more likely of a 2020 thing now, but still uh, definitely agree the uh, Michelin Pilot Challenge series is looking pretty darn cool now as it is in TCR, and if we can add yet another manufacturer, I think that would be awesome. Uh, next year, you know, I'll just throw this out, and I'm sure you thought of it and probably pitched it 15 different ways, but knowing how you and our mutual friend, your Dinner with Racers partner in crime, Sean Heckman, pretty good at making the old films, and uh, knowing how awesome your Alan Colwicky uh, docu little docu-series was, just saying, Art and Steve, who hopefully are listening, um, there'd be a pretty cool little 
uh, Heckman Eversley video film social something of you testing the ARX 05 DPI, and I know that there'd be a lot of lot of Dinner with Racer fans and just Brian Eversley fans in general who would be uh, burning up the old interwebs trying to consume that. Yeah, we, we, we've been really fortunate with our following from the podcast, which is definitely backed by Acura as well as Continental Tire, but um, it's been neat to have fans like we, we literally have fans now that come to the track for sports car racing that found us through that Alan Kalicki thing, or maybe our Tony Stewart episode or something that we're like, Oh, what's this, uh, what's the sports car stuff about? Which is like super crazy to me, you know, that we've converted people from that. But, uh, it's been, it's been an incredible response, not just with the podcast, but also with the racing stuff. And so that's why I, I pitched so hard to drive the DPI car because I'm like, Hey, look, I was the little ST car guy, you know, racing little civics against people you probably never heard of that were better than people you have. And we were successful with that. And then I got to do the GT stuff and we've been, I'd, I'd say successful with that. So why don't we just keep going and maybe get an Indy car test going? There's a, I mean, there's a Formula, Formula One program out there with Honda engines in it now. Let's, let's keep it going. People have been put on notice. Jobs are at stake. You might be <laughs> right, put out of work. Right. Hashtag Ryan's trying to put you out of work. <laughs> well, let's close on one of our favorite topics. I wouldn't ask you to give away anything uh, that we shouldn't know, but Dinner with Racers, again, one of uh, a staple, uh, very few staples, I think, in folks' uh, motor racing podcast lives. Uh, what are you and Sean working on in general of when we might see some new stuff coming out and is there more fun uh, meant to be had here with DWR? Yeah, the podcast numbers have been been really, really strong and Continental, you know, despite them leaving road racing for the time being, have backed us 100%. As soon as they knew they were out of IMSA, um, they, they were like, hey, look, don't think that this means we are not still racing or, or interested and, and we want to work with you on everything. So we've been slowly working on projects that will take us to different, you know, different avenues of what we want to do. But the podcast will be coming back, you know, for sure. In 2019, we're going to have episodes coming out. And uh, it's been it's been really cool. They were such a strong partner of us for us that they told us early on, like, hey, we know we're not going to be back doing the IMSA thing. But that doesn't mean you can't continue to do anything you want. And we don't care if you're racing on Michelin's. We don't care if you're racing on Pirelli's because we know you drive every day on Continentals. And I thought that was super cool because a lot of fans, when they announced the Continental thing were that they were leaving, yeah, uh, <clears throat> they're like, well, what's that going to do to your show? And I, and I had to remind them that I hadn't raced full time on Continentals since the show started, <laughs> which I guess people kind of forget. So, um, so yeah, it, it'll be a, another fun year of playing with my favorite person to sit in a car for multiple days on end, Sean Hagman. I just, I mean, I can barely stand texting with the guy. How you endure day after day. Ah, just such a loathsome human being. But, you know, <laughs> you know I mean, you're getting hazard pay from this. And I, I would be remiss if we closed. I heard you mention the name of your tire sponsor, but I didn't recognize the cadence. So, oh, right, yeah, right. you might need to help us out here because I don't think we can we can close this interview without hearing the proper name. I'll, I'll tell a really quick story. My buddy Andy Hollis, who is a uh, club racer of his own, he does like the One Lap of America. He's mm. a super cool guy. He came up to me one year. I was coaching Jeff Mosing because Eric Foss is out of the country for an event. Yeah. At, Coda like two or three years ago and we had a stupid 6 a.m. or something driver's meeting for a club series that doesn't understand what sleeping in is all about and this Andy runs up to me and he's like say it say it and I had no idea what he wanted <laughs> and, and, and I'm like what, what do I say and he goes say it and Jeff goes I think he wants to do the tire thing and I went oh god metal tire and he just like gave me a high five and ran off to the driver's meeting and I'm not a morning person, but he told me later that I nailed it. So I was pretty happy about that. Oh, and you know, <laughs> right now, I'm going to go ahead and start a GoFundMe page because we need to get, and again, this is 40, 50, many years down the road, but when dear Ryan Eversley passes, he needs to have a gravestone where folks can walk up and push a button and hear you in perpetuity right. say, God, I'm right. tired. So, exactly. exactly uh, right. I love it. <laughs> well, hey, man, as always, you know, uh, big fan of you and what you do as a race car driver always you know from day one been a huge fan of uh dinner with racers and always rooting for your success i do know when i was reminded over the rolex 24 that folks 
some folks don't quite get that we're all friends and have fun <laughs> and, and being nice to one another, at least on social media, is kind of a, a no-no and we try and give each other a hard time. So thanks right. for, I guess, the, the help or the save when I decided an inside joke between Sean and I about uh, when you guys um, had a, a person at a restaurant take your request for a, a <laughs> reservation and ask if uh, it was for race uh, dinner with racists. Uh, thanks for the little save during Daytona where some folks thought I was all of a sudden disparaging your fine product there. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, no worries. Congrats, no worries, my buddy. man. Happy to hear that you're... Uh, you got a job, man, and uh, that's that's what it's all about. Staying staying afloat here, right? So that's all I'm going for. Just keeping keeping my job. And look forward to seeing you and uh, Sean hopefully at Sebring, and then we will certainly be watching our feeds for some awesome new dinner with racers content coming. So thanks for spending some time, Ryan. My pleasure, Marshall. Thanks a lot. Bud. And that was your Monday edition of Inside the Sports Car Paddock. We'll be back tomorrow again with that Asian Le Mans Series special conducted solely by our pal Graham Goodwin. Also here just a few days away from the launch of MarshallPruittPodcast.com, something that will have all 400-plus episodes that we have dropped since this little podcast came to life in May of 2016, and hoping you're going to love that. And we'll have some new, I don't know if I'd say new, but at least updated, fun logos for some of our shows, cartoons done by our pal Roger Warwick, all with 2019 in mind. All right. I'm Marshall Pruitt. This is the Marshall Pruitt Podcast, brought to you by the Justice Brothers and Cooper Tires. Thank you for listening. <laughs>